So um, how do I do that? Just, just read the blurb from the website. Okay, just start talking. Yep. All right, we will do that. Okay, this is Dave Crawford. He's kindly agreed to come speak to us. And Dave is a uh, master naturalist and he is a retired Minnesota State Park naturalist. And he'll talk about the benefits and use of native plants in feeding native pollinators. And he's also um, uh, had a lot of experience pioneering new methods of citizen involvement in prairie restoration. So take it away, Dave. Okay, I'm gonna thanks. interject real quick. Um, everyone, if you could just mute your, your um, Zoom so that no background noises leak in while we're going through the presentation. And if you forget, I will help you. <laughs> All right, now fire away. All right, I'm glad to be with you tonight. Um, this is my first uh, virtual lecture. I've done live lectures a lot. Um, so uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm going to talk about native plants and their role in supporting pollinators. I'm going to talk about um, how I got started with this myself um, and why native plants matter. I hope your screen is updating. I'm seeing some kind of weird stuff on my presenter view. Um, so are you seeing the line, what are pollinators now? I need feedback from yes, somebody. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. I see head, nods, head nods, good. All right. I'm seeing your face with some plants okay. behind you. You look like you're in your yard. Yeah, that's my virtual background. That's my yard in White Bear Lake. Uh, where unfortunately I left that house behind back in April of this year and I'm living in um, the Como neighborhood, which is a really great neighborhood, but the yard is not as interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm working on that. So what I'll be doing is um, talking about the needs of pollinators, how we can provide for those needs. Um, and throughout this presentation, you're going to see photographs and videos of pollinating insects um, and those, other than the ones that are marked with a different photographer credit, they're all mine, mostly from my yard and, or from Wild River State Park. Um, I got started with native plants, um, mainly because of uh, an interest in botany and an interest in, in Minnesota native plant restoration. And so I did quite a lot of restoration work at Wild River State Park. Um, and in my own yard. And I think I should define native for you so that we're all on the same page with that. It's basically a native organism is any organism that's indigenous to a specified geographic area like Minnesota. Um, it occurs there naturally. It wasn't introduced by human extension of its range. Um, native organisms are typically very well adapted to the environment they're in and also very well um, integrated into the overall ecosystem so that they uh, may even become dependent on interactions with other native species in that ecosystem. So the work that I did um, that got me going with this was a uh, restoration of about a square mile of prairie from what had been um, former cultivated land at Wild River State Park. It had been oak savanna before it was cultivated. So one of my charges was to help bring that back to a more natural state. And also I worked in my own yard, um, starting with the idea of landscaping for wildlife, simply providing all the habitat necessities for birds and insects and mammals and reptiles. No reptiles showed up, but we had some amphibians, frogs and toads and so on. Um, and as a consequence of doing that, I encountered a lot of insects, even though I had no background in insect identification. Um, I, I started running into them and I started getting to know, especially the butterflies, because they're easy, they're charismatic. Um, and it, it wasn't until about 2014 that I thought, well, you know, there's all these bees out there and there's all these other pollinating insects and maybe I should start getting to know what they're all about also. Um, so I started to expand a bit. Now, 
the relationship between pollinators and native plants is an important one. And so the question of why native plants matter is also important uh, when we're talking about pollinators. And the question of pollinators is important when we're talking about native plants. We know that pollinators are declining. There are numerous studies out that show a, a radical decrease in the number of insects in general. Um, and that applies to pollinating insects as well. We also know about honeybee declines from numerous studies and um, numerous reports by beekeepers of colony collapse disorder and other problems. Um, I want to say that honeybees are the tip of the iceberg because what we know about them is relatively extensive compared to our native pollinators because beekeepers monitor the health of their bee colonies and they know when something's going wrong but there isn't equivalent monitoring for native pollinators. Uh, there's getting to be more and more. There are formal programs and citizen science programs, and those are finding more and more that the native pollinators are disappearing or declining. I say honeybees are the tip of the iceberg, but I actually think I should describe them as the wrong iceberg because they're not native. Honeybees are a species introduced from Europe um, they're basically from the perspective of a native insect ecologist. Honeybees are the equivalent of cattle. They're the equivalent of livestock. Um, they will not go extinct because humans are taking really good care of them. The precaution is that the native insects don't have anyone caring for them with an equivalent level of oversight. And the consequences, if we were to see a decline in honeybees, would certainly be a decline in pollination of food crops. But the consequences, if we saw a decline, a sustained decline in excuse me, the native pollinators, we would see a decline of whole ecosystems because so many plants are dependent on those native pollinators. So Minnesota is home to over 400 species of bees that are native, above and beyond the non-native honeybee. Um, of those, we think that many of them are in trouble. There's a potential that some may have gone extinct before they've even been described as species. Most of this is due to changes in habitat, um, changes in land use that result in, in fewer and fewer places that have populations of food plants that are available for the native pollinators. And there's, of course, a, a role that chemicals play in this as well, insecticides and herbicides and others. So I wanted to talk about how some of these insects are highly specialized. The one that I just expanded on the screen is a hairy banded mining bee. It's um, very specialized, not to the degree that, say, a monarch caterpillar is specialized to eat only milkweed. A hairy banded mining bee can cross a couple of different genera of plants. It can take pollen from asters and it can also take pollen from goldenrods and even a few other members of the composite family. What happens if it doesn't have those flowers present is that it may be able to feed itself, but the pollen that it collects for its nests to raise its larvae, doesn't have the correct nutrient mix or the correct trace chemicals, and so it will not have an, a, an effective chance to reproduce and to sustain itself in a location that doesn't have the right plants in it. Another one that I'm expanding here in the lower left corner, um, that's a Golden Alexander's mining bee. That one is um, very specific to the pollen from Golden Alexanders, a native plant in Minnesota, um, and related species. So it may do well on other members of the parsley family. Um, and then there's this one, the aberrant <clears throat> me, cellophane bee. This one is extremely specific. It only collects pollen from prairie clover. There's only three species of prairie clover in Minnesota. Any place where those species are not present, this bee is not present. Um, it's, it's a fascinating thing to know, for me to know, that there are these specialists 
and I suspect that there are many more that we don't know about. Some commentators have suggested that up to half of the native bees in Minnesota specialize to some degree. They may have such strong preferences that they can be called specialists. And that's contrasted with the honeybee, for instance, who is um, basically a generalist species, can handle just about any kind of flower. Now, <clears throat> I've talked about bees so far, but clearly there are other pollinators. Um, wasps can be very important pollinators. Butterflies, of course, moths, flies, beetles, and there's a handful of other insects and even some non-insects that are pollinators. Um, many of these are dependent on or at least prefer native plant environments. So what's the definition of a pollinator? I use this definition. Any organism which effectively transports pollen from one flower of a given species to another flower of the same species. And hopefully the video is coming through without too much jerkiness. I noticed there was some problem in refresh rate when I tested this out, um, but we'll just have to live with what we have. So in effect, a human with a paintbrush that goes and dabs pollen out of one flower and dabs it into another flower is a pollinator by this definition. And so is a hummingbird if it moves pollen from one flower to another. But when we think of pollinators, we mostly think of bees. Bees, in my mind, can be considered professionals. It's not that they are specifically um, paid to pollinate, although if you look at the relationship between a plant and its pollinator, you do have to wonder who is using whom. Um, the plants produce call it advertising, a scent and a sweet nectar and big flashy petals or whatever indicators are necessary to get insects interested. The insects come, they take whatever benefit they can get and incidentally also pick up some pollen grains and may transfer them to the next flower along the way. The reason I say bees are professionals at this is that bees collect pollen to provision their nests. And so they are basically being paid in pollen for their work in moving pollen from flower to flower. They don't carry all of the pollen back to their nest. So they comb pollen out of the hairs on their body. They um, place that pollen in a cake on their leg, in the case of bumblebees and honeybees, or as a, a loose clump of pollen in the case of many other bees, or um, some bee species in Minnesota pack pollen underneath their abdomen. They don't get every last pollen grain off of their face and off of their body and off of their legs. So the next time they visit a flower, they can transfer that pollen to a new flower and that can result in cross fertilization, which can result in healthier seed production. There are even some bees that don't carry pollen externally. Yellow-faced bees, for instance, carry the pollen in a crop, um, basically, part of the digestive system before the stomach so the pollen doesn't get digested and it can be regurgitated at the nest. The variety of sizes and shapes and um, time periods that these bees are active is part of an indication of why native plants and native pollinators go together. When you look at these two photographs, these are in scale with one another. The bumblebee on the left might be, oh, seven-eighths of an inch long. That's a black and gold bumblebee on a wild bergamot blossom. The smaller bee on the right is one of the sweat bees in genus Lasia blossom. There are so many of them that I'm still bewildered um, as to exactly which species I'm looking at and probably always will be. Um, you can see just from the size alone that there are going to be some flowers that the bumblebee is simply not going to be able to use effectively and some flowers that that very small bee may not be able to use effectively and we'll see more of that as we go along in this presentation. Bumblebees, I wonder if you all have an idea of how many species there are in Minnesota. When I began photographing pollinators deliberately in 2014, I was under the very false impression that Minnesota had two species of bumblebees. 
I was very uneducated. Um, and I very quickly learned that there were a whole lot more than two. Um, when I started doing photography, I fairly quickly found five species. These are some of the more common species in Minnesota. It didn't take long before I added to that some of the less common species and even some that are less common yet. Um, and I finally did get a photograph of a yellow bumblebee. That's a species that's definitely imperiled. It's definitely in decline. Um, people are not reporting them nearly as often or in nearly as many places. And the one that's really kind of the prize bumblebee, if you're trying to be the first on your block to collect all of them, um, the rusty patch bumblebee is extremely rare and is now listed as a federally endangered species. Its range has collapsed to 10% or less of its former known range. Um, with all of those 12 species I photographed, I'm still only about halfway there. There's 23 species known in Minnesota. Bumblebees can use a wide variety of flowers, but you can see that this one on rock crest um, is kind of overwhelming the flower's ability to hold the bee up. And where you see bumblebees really specializing is on flowers that have a closed structure, like turtle head, which is in the snapdragon family. The flower petals are cupped very close together, pressed tightly together, and it takes a very strong bee to push itself into that blossom to get at the nectar and the pollen that is inside. The other flower, wild indigo, I have to um, admit that blue wild indigo is not native in Minnesota. It's native in most of the rest of the Midwest, and it grows well in Minnesota, and I love the color, so I have it in my garden. Um, Indigo, whether it's the wild blue or wild white or wild cream colored, um, the flower requires a fairly heavy insect to sit on those lower petals to get them to drop far enough for the flower to open and allow access to the nectar. So bumblebees are particularly well suited to these large flowers. And in fact, large flowers are excluding other bees because the smaller bees are not as effective at moving the pollen from one of these flowers to another. The one that really shines for bumblebees, this is bottle gentian. Have you seen this one? Uh, it's a flower that doesn't open. It stays closed like an umbrella closed. Um, and it takes a, a fairly strong bee to force its way into that flower. Bumblebees can do that. So if you ever notice a bottle gentian that's moving or that's buzzing, um, sit down, take a look, see what happens. You might see a bumblebee coming out. A little bit more on bumblebees. They are social in much the same way that honeybees are. So there's a colony with a single queen. She lays all the eggs. Um, there are other females which are workers. They do all of the care of the larvae and all of the foraging for food. Um, and they will help with constructing additional nest cells. And then there are the drones whose sole function seems to be to mate with new queens so that the whole cycle can start over again the next year. Bumblebees establish their nests in abandoned mammal burrows or um, hollow spaces that can be either natural or constructed. And they may even nest under leaf litter, which is one of the reasons that I really like the motto, leave the leaves because if you rake up all the leaves in your yard, you're raking up um, basically the housing for a lot of insects that we would probably like to keep having around. As for other bee species in Minnesota, there are quite a few sweat bee species that are social in a similar way, but by far the majority of other Minnesota bees are solitary, uh, which means there's just a single female that builds a nest all by herself she lays her own eggs. She gathers her food to provision the nest cells where she lays the eggs. Uh, there are no workers. There are males flying around out there, but they don't spend any time in the nest with the female. And so it's, it's an entirely solitary lifestyle, although some of them may be colonial to the extent that you'll find multiple nests in a very small area, but each nest still is individual and has its own individual female. 
as far as where other bees live besides bumblebees, mining bees, sweat bees, cellophane bees, long-horned bees, and digger bees are all underground nesting species. They need bare soil in order to nest. That patch of bare soil doesn't have to be big. I've seen some of these bees in the lawn uh, where they'll fly over to a blade of grass, crawl down the grass, find a bare patch of soil on the ground next to the clump of grass and make their nest there. But if you have a really solid carpet, like a, a golf fairway, um, there's nothing, there's no nesting location that's even available for those insects. The other group of bees that we have in Minnesota include mason and carpenter bees, yellow-faced bees, leafcutter bees, resin bees, and some others, and they are cavity nesters. So instead of making a hole in the ground or excavating a hole in the ground, they will use either existing cavities or they'll make their own in wood or in plant stems or um, whatever, whatever is available for, and whatever suits their style. Mason bees, for instance, frequently use existing cavities like gaps in the siding of a house um, or bee hotels or um, hollow spots in trees that have been hammered out by woodpeckers. Um, and then there are carpenter bees and resin bees that make their home. I apologize for the lawnmower. I just couldn't control the audio when I shot this footage. These will use dead plant stems and excavate the center out of the stem and then lay their eggs and provision the nest inside that hollow stem. This is one of the reasons I don't like to clean up my garden in the fall. Um, I like to leave plants with seed heads for winter interest for my own sake and for the sake of the pollinators that use my gardens, I wanna leave those stalks standing through the winter because that's where a lot of the pupae or the dormant adult bees are overwintering to emerge again in the spring. So the prescription that I would give you for um, caring for a garden that has native plants would be leave the stalks standing in the winter and in the spring, break them off maybe 15 inches to 18 inches above ground level um, so that the hollow interiors or the, the soft interiors are exposed and then those standing stems become nurseries for the cavity nesting bee species um, and they by the end of the following growing season they'll fall over on their own and they become part of the, the litter on the ground which can also be shelter for additional beneficial insects. If you have ground nesting bees you need to have soil that's light enough that they can move it around in this case, there's a mining bee that is almost literally vibrating itself through the loose grains at the surface to get down to the opening of a burrow that it has excavated where the grains are sticking together a little better, where it's a little moister down below. Um, in a spot that has soil whose particles stick together better, you'll often see bees resting at the mouth of their burrow before they fly out to forage for additional food to stock additional nest cells. How many of you kind of are leery of wasps? Okay, I see some hands coming up. Um, wasps do have a bad reputation and I am going to say it's mostly undeserved. I have to tell you that as a very up close and intimate insect photographer, most of my photos are taken from between I would say nine inches and two inches away from the insect, which means I'm shoving a big camera in the face of these critters that could sting me if they wanted to. And since 2014, I have yet to be stung by any of the insects that I've been photographing. I did get a sting from a yellow jacket that I stepped on while I was stalking another insect, but hey, that's excusable. I wouldn't want to be stepped on either. A distinction that is really important to be aware of is that social wasps versus solitary wasps are a whole different ball of wax when you're talking about the potential of being stung. And really the potential is only present if you disturb the nest. Social wasps, you may have 
30 or 100 or even 1,000 individuals in a single nest. And they're mostly females, and they are mostly um, very protective of the entire colony and all of its larvae, which means if you disturb the nest or if you get too close, um, they may come out and invite you to go elsewhere. And they only have one way to do that, and that's to sting you. If you approach the nest of a solitary wasp, first of all, you probably won't even know that you're approaching it because they're very well concealed. And second, they're not terrifically defensive. Most of the time, there's no one home. Um, so you aren't at risk of being stung. And if you're approaching wasps that are on flowers or wasps that are doing much of anything except maybe yellow jackets that are trying to steal your food, uh, you won't be stung. The reason wasps have stingers is that they are predators. They use their stinger to hunt prey, insects usually, or spiders, um, and they bring those spiders, their, their venom paralyzes the insect, and they bring those spiders and insects back to their nests and use them to provision their nest cells. So it's a waste for the wasp to have to use its sting in self-defense. And as a result, they rarely ever do that. Wasps aren't what I would call really outstanding pollinators on most plants, although there are some plant species that are highly adapted to attracting wasps, and wasps can be very effective pollinators on those. But because wasps don't bring pollen back for their young, they don't have to collect pollen to the degree that bees do. And so their pollination is more incidental. They're amateurs where bees are professionals. I want to talk very briefly about the variety of prey insects that some of our native wasps go after. Great black wasps, which I also call the Darth Vader wasp for obvious reasons, will provision their nest cells with katydids. If you've ever had an outbreak of katydids where the population skyrocketed, and they've started to eat all the foliage they can find, you know that it's a good thing to have something around that keeps their numbers in check. So next time you don't see a katydid eating one of your plants, thank a great black wasp. Same thing with Bicertes genus sand wasps. They provision their nests with stink bugs. So the next time you don't see a stink bug, thank a Bicertes sand wasp. And this one is a species of beetle wasp called the smoky winged beetle bandit. It feeds on emerald ash borer beetles and related beetles. And so here again, we've got wasps that are doing ecological services on our behalf by reducing the number of um, pest insects. They're not enough to stop emerald ash borers, but they're enough to slow the spread. And then there's a whole group of wasps that are too small even to be noticed by most people. This is an aphid wasp, and she is actually stabbing eggs into aphid bodies on the bottom of a milkweed leaf in this particular case. There are quite a few species of aphid wasps, and they go after a variety of different aphids. But the upshot is each one of those eggs hatches, the larva that hatches from it eats the aphid from the inside, Sorry about the airplane, couldn't tell him to leave, had to get the, the shot. And the aphid's body then becomes the pupa for the wasp to pupate and ultimately for the new adults to emerge and start the whole thing over again. As far as pollination, I mentioned that these are not professionals, but if you look closely at a wasp that is on a flower, you can often see that there's a considerable amount of pollen clinging to that wasp's body, which means that there is pollen transportation taking place, and so pollination is being effectively managed. This little guy, a uh, gal, probably um, a carrot wasp or a gasteruptid wasp, not much bigger than, say, three mosquitoes laid end to end. If you zoom in on her face, you see that she's got pollen grains all over, so she is doing a good job of transporting pollen. In this case, the flower is flowering spurge, a Minnesota native that I really love. There are also some plants that have become very well adapted to 
I guess you could say, using wasps as pollinators. Dotted mint is one that specializes. Now watch that wasp shake its head back and forth. When it's doing that, it's acquiring nectar and pollen, but it's also um, in a position where the top petal of the flower is bending down, touching the wasp on the back, and leaving a big splotch of pollen there. The next time that that wasp goes into a dotted mint flower, the top petal bends down and also adds more pollen, but it also picks up some of the pollen grains that were there already. So it's cross-pollination at work. And we get to butterflies. Um, on the whole, they are gorgeous to look at, but people have speculated that they're not necessarily very effective at pollination. When you think about how bees do it, they climb right into the flower. They get pollen all over their body. You look at a butterfly and they have long legs. They stand up off of the flower. They stick their long curled proboscis down into the flower. There's not much chance for pollen to adhere to them, but there are some flowers, native flowers in particular, whose structure lends itself to being pollinated by butterflies better than being pollinated by other insects. Um, things like this Carolina cocoon, um, is, that's one example. Um, wild blue phlox, prairie phlox, um, any of the flowers that have a flat disc face and a tubular um, vessel beneath that flat-faced flower are likely to be very good uh, very well pollinated by butterflies. And then we get to moths. Um, people think of moths as nighttime creatures, and most of them are. The one on the left is a webworm moth on common milkweed. I shot that with flash because um, I wanted to know, okay, do milkweeds continue to do pollination, uh, I mean, um, food service uh, at night? And they, they definitely do. There's a lot of insects that use milkweed at night. It's fascinating to watch. Other moths are daytime flyers, um, celery looper, which is one that you don't want to have if you grow celery uh, because the caterpillars eat celery, rubbed darts, um, and then the one on the lower right, even though the collar on that moth right behind the head is orange, the proper name of the moth is a yellow collared scape moth. I have to guess that the entomologist that named that one might have had some color blindness issues. The moths that are really fascinating to me are the ones in the um, sphinx moth family um, because they fly like hummingbirds do. So these are white line sphinx on large flowered penstemon. They're almost as big as hummingbirds. And if you see them out of the corner of your eye, you might think that you're seeing a hummingbird instead of a moth. Another one that I really love seeing is this. This is a hummingbird clearwing moth. There are other clearwings. Um, there's snowberry clearwings and, and a, another species in Minnesota. Um, and they're just loads of fun to watch. From a distance, they look like bumblebees. When you get close, you realize, uh, there's something funny about that bumblebee. It doesn't look quite right. And of course, looking like a bumblebee is a benefit if there are predators in the neighborhood because predators tend not to want to pursue insects that may sting them. And so if you look like a bumblebee, you're less likely to be eaten. Then we get to flies. I used to think of flies as those things that you swap before they land on your picnic lunch. Um, and indeed, there are a lot of flies that look like, gosh, I wouldn't want that one crawling around on my sandwich. But even these, many of these flies, um, one in particular, this um, green blowfly or a green bottle fly is a very efficient pollinator. Uh, one entomologist told me that that fly is more effective at pollinating onions and cabbages than any bee is. So don't discount flies as pollinators. So there's the house fly looking ones, and then there are the bee flies, so named because they hover like bees, they fly like bees. Some of them, like the one on the left, even looks a lot like a bee. What distinguishes them is very long legs and a very, very long mouth part, a very stiff tongue that they can stick down into. For instance, that flower on the left is Carolina Pocoon again. Um, the second bee fly in that row of photos does not look like a bee. To me, it looks more like a pussy willow with wings and a raccoon mask. Uh, 
I'm not quite sure what advantage that confers on that insect. Uh, it's foraging on stiff goldenrod. And the one that's black and white, um, I think, is another candidate for looking like Darth Vader. And again, I don't know what advantage that confers on it, but it sure looks cool. There are flies that look so much like wasps that you would probably have to look at them up really, really close to see that they aren't wasps after all. They have no sting. Um, however, predators leave them alone because they look like they can sting. And then there's a whole raft of what are called surfid flies or flower flies or hover flies. Many of them have the black and yellow striping patterns that people associate with yellow jackets and other stinging insects. And that helps these insects um, evade predators. There are some flower flies that mimic bumblebees for that reason also. There are, are some that mimic mason wasps. There are some that mimic yellow jackets even more than those two on the left do. And then there are some hoverflies that don't seem to mimic anything dangerous at all, but have some other interesting traits. Um, this one that's on the right is in the genus Toxomerus, and its common name, which is shared with other flies of that type, um, so you can find many of these, um, they are all called aphid-eating flower flies. It's not because the adults eat aphids. They go after the nectar of flowers, but their larvae eat aphids. This is um, a Toxomerus larva that is consuming an aphid right under the jaws of the ant that's attempting to protect the aphid from being eaten. Um, and nobody yet seems to know exactly how these larvae get away with this because ants are fiercely protective if they are herding aphids. Um, they will take on just about anything that tries to get any of those aphids. But in this case, they just seem to sort of watch and you see little question mark thought balloons coming up above their heads because they don't know quite what to do. There are also beetles that you'll find frequently on flowers. There's in fact a whole group of what are called flower longhorn beetles. Um, and there are two of them in this montage, the, the kind of yellow and black striped one on the lower left and the banded one that's in the center on the right-hand column. Uh, but there are many, many other beetles that you'll find on flowers. And I shouldn't forget to mention hummingbirds as pollinators. Um, what intrigues me is, I think, People are used to the idea that hummingbirds go to flowers, and they're not really acquainted with the fact that there are, are a fair number of other birds that also do this. It's not as common in Minnesota, but um, in the tropical part of their range, there are several species of warblers that summer in Minnesota, and during the winter part of their um, life, they are um, flower visitors. They collect pollen, they collect nectar, um, among them would be the Tennessee warbler and the Cape May warbler. And there's recently been a lot of attention paid to the fact that Tennessee warblers seem to really like the catkins of oak trees. They go for the pollen that's on those catkins. They get their breasts smeared with pollen to the degree that some bird watchers think they've discovered a new species because the breast is such a bright yellow color from the pollen. And it kind of um, muddies the water. There used to be a strong distinction in most people's minds between insect pollinated plants and wind pollinated plants. And oak would be an example of a wind pollinated plant. Well, nature is never that simple. Nature, um, if there's a resource out there, there's going to be something that exploits the resource. So people have been documenting pollinators, pollinating insects also, on wind pollinated plants, including on grasses, um, including on trees. Um, so we're just beginning to know the whole breadth of what's going on out there. Now, as far as what we can do to help pollinators, the number one thing is plant more native flowering plants. Remember that pollinators in Minnesota co-evolved with native plants in Minnesota. If you bring in a plant from somewhere else, the pollinator may be able to use it, but if you bring in a plant that's locally native, 
there will be a native pollinator that will know how to use it very well and may be more effective at pollinating it than any other insect is. Cranberries, for instance, um, honeybees do a terrible job of pollinating cranberries. Bumblebees do a great job of pollinating cranberries. So cranberries, um, even if they're domesticated, they're bred from species that were wild and native in this area. Um, it's also important if you want to have butterflies to plant the caterpillar foods for those butterflies. So I'm guessing a lot of you have milkweed for that reason. Um, there are plenty of other plants that would be beneficial for other insects. All you have to do is look at a guide to butterflies and flip to the section usually in the back that describes what the larval food plants are and then consider whether you want to have those plants in your yard. So there are fritillaries that feed on violet leaves, for instance. There are um, red admirals and Compton tortoise shells and Milbert's tortoise shells and several species of comma butterflies that feed on nettle leaves. Um, maybe you're not going to grow nettle in your um, gardens right next to your house, but if you've got an out of the way place in the back corner of the yard, you can try it and see if you get more of those butterflies coming and staying in your yard. It's important to avoid nicotinoid, neonicotinoid pesticides if you can. Um, the evidence is mounting. Um, study after study is coming in with results that are pretty sobering about how much the residue of these pesticides is present in uh, parts of the plant that pollinators use and how the, even the sublethal doses that insects are exposed to and sublethal doses that birds are exposed to are compromising the health of the insects and the birds and reducing their ability to compete and survive successfully. It's also wise to avoid unnecessary use of other chemicals. There are more and more studies that show that a mixture of chemicals, herbicides together with insecticides have a multiplier effect in damaging insect health. Not an additive effect, but actually a multiplication effect so that the, the combinations of pesticides get to be extremely problematic for these insects. It's important to preserve nesting habitat and if possible to increase it um, and to do that Leave some undisturbed soil. If you, for instance, till regularly or weed regularly, you may want to have some areas that you don't do that in because that disturbance can disturb the um, burrows that the ground nesting bees use. You will probably want to avoid heavy mulching. Not everywhere. Obviously, there are places where mulch is very useful, but if you mulch everything, then there's zero ground available, zero available soil for those ground nesting species. I mentioned leaving dead plant stalks standing so that the insects that carve out their own little nest burrows inside those standing stems can um, use those to raise their kids and don't rake up all the leaf litter and leave some dead wood. There are pollinator species that will either make their nest burrows in wood that's beginning to decay um, or they'll use that rotting wood for part of their life cycle. And so a downed log or a downed tree limb is a benefit to those species. If you do all of these things, you'll be providing the greatest possible diversity of habitat for the greatest possible variety of pollinators. And I can tell you from my experience in my home in White Bear Lake, that following these practices, which I was doing before I knew about pollinators, I was just doing it because it was more wildlife friendly in general. Um, when I started documenting pollinators in my yard um, over the period from 2014 to the present, um, I, I documented over 200 species of pollinators, 40 some species of bees, 40 some species of wasps, 40 some species of flies, and then a huge variety of other things. And they were all there because the habitat was good. The native plants were there for them to forage on, the nest sites were there, the overwintering sites were there, and I was 
um, avoiding using pesticides except for spot spraying Roundup on Canada thistle. That was one that I finally caved in and said, okay, I'm going to use Roundup. Uh, all right, so why native plants and not non-native? I don't know if I've addressed that in enough detail besides this idea that the native plants and the native pollinators evolved together. Let's just take an example of a field check that I did. Um, back in 2014, when I first started photographing pollinators, I decided I'm going to go to downtown White Bear Lake and I'm going to see what's in the flower gardens there. Now those flower gardens, White Bear Lake, somebody really likes daylilies. I like daylilies too. They're bright, they're colorful, um, they're easy to grow. But what do they do for pollinators? And after spending half an hour watching a patch of daylilies and photographing what I could see, I came up with two species of pollinators total for that half hour. And both species are from Europe, European paper wasp and European honeybee. So not particularly good for native insects. And then I tried another time, big patch of daylily, must have been three, 400 blossoms open at once. And by searching and searching and searching, I finally was able to find one native sweat bee. And then I saw a second one and a third one, and that was it. So a flower in my own yard that is a native flower would have multiple visits over a period of several minutes. In this case, there were 300 flowers and they were getting three visits over a period of uh, maybe 15 minutes that I was searching. Three bees found those 300 flowers and made some use of them. So the native plants can be crucially important. It's not that the insects can't feed themselves the pollen or the nectar from non-native plants. It's that the quality of the food is different. I liken it to, would you prefer the nutrition you get by buying food at a farmer's market, or would you prefer the nutrition you get by buying your food at McDonald's? Yes, you can live on the food you get from McDonald's, but you might not have as good a quality of life as if you get your food from your own vegetable garden or from a farmer's market. And that's a good parallel to what these insects are finding as far as using native plants compared to non-native plants. One more example, this is right outside the house that I'm living in now in St. Paul. Uh, I photographed this last year. The flower is a cultivar of greenhead coneflower. Um, greenhead coneflower is a black-eyed Susan relative. It's native in Minnesota. Um, the usual shape of the flower is to have one ring of yellow petals around the outside. Those are the ray flowers in a composite flower in this family, the aster family. And the center of the flower is composed entirely of disc flowers. Think of a sunflower where all the seeds are. Those are disc flowers. And then the ring of petals around the outside, those are ray flowers. It's only the disc flowers that produce pollen and nectar. And so this particular cultivar, which has been bred to produce more ray flowers so that it'll have more petals so that humans will find it more attractive is less attractive to bees. Less food is available. I've seen varieties of green head cone flower that have no disc flowers at all. It's all ray petals. There's no nectar. There's no pollen. There's nothing there for the bee. It's all for the human that planted the plant. So even though this is bred from a native plant, it doesn't provide the needs that those pollinators have for the food they forage for. Um, that is not true for all of the cultivars of native plants. There are some cultivars that, for instance, have been bred, instead of to look different, they're bred to bloom for a longer period of time. Those cultivars may actually get more use by pollinators than the wild type does, because they provide those floral resources for a longer period. What I wanna do now is go through some of the plants that I have used um, in my own yard back in White Bear Lake to attract bees. And just to give you an example, this chart, uh, this is in the handout that Brianna said she would share with all of you. Um, and actually a lot of what I've just told you is also in that handout. The idea is if you're going to create native plantings in a particular location, you want to select plants that'll do well under the growing conditions of that location. But if you're also 
planting for pollinators, you want to have floral resources available throughout the growing season, all the way from April into at least September and possibly even October. So by choosing a spectrum of species that bloom in progression, you can get that. The first one that I want to draw attention to is something that's not showy at all. Willows and maples are plants, are trees that have inconspicuous flowers, but they produce nectar, they produce pollen, um, and they draw a tremendous variety of bees. This particular um, plant that I photographed these bees on is prairie willow. It's relatively short, which is really good if what you want to do is photograph the bees, because climbing up on a 30-foot tall ladder into the crown of a very large willow is just not practical. Um, Another group of plants that I would want to have in any garden where I wanted to have food for pollinators would be fruiting trees and fruiting shrubs. They can be native, but they don't have to be. When people have domesticated fruit plants, they still need to be sure that those fruit plants attract pollinators because the quality of the fruit set is going to depend on those flowers getting pollinated. And so those domesticated fruit bearing plants will still provide the resources that pollinators need. Otherwise, they'll fail as fruit producing plants. So black cherry on the left, wild raspberry on the right. Um, for ground layer species, I think it's really important to have very early bloomers. I mentioned bloodroot um, in the table that's in your handout. I don't have a photo of a pollinator on bloodroot. I have yet to catch one in the act. Um, but I have seen bumblebees on that large flowered bellwort, the yellow blossom. And I see tons of pollinators on wild strawberry. I see lots and lots of pollinators on false Solomon seal and on Solomon seal. And there is actually a plant that most people would call a weed um, that is native to Minnesota that is really valuable. So I'm going to pop it up here. This is kidney leaf buttercup. It's a scrawny little thing with a tiny little flower that you, you can hardly tell that there's any yellow there at all besides the pollen. But the bees go crazy over it. They just land on it and use it like mad. Um, and so if it's kind of mixed into your mowed lawn, and if you don't mow during May, you may have heard the, the slogan, no mow May, uh, this year. And it seems to have been a fairly successful campaign in terms of more pollinators getting what they need. This would be one of the plants that could be in your lawn, along with wild violets and, and many other native species that the bees can use. I really champion wild geranium, and I, I would say get the wild type if you can, not the cultivars, because I've seen the cultivars in people's gardens, and I have not seen many pollinators on them. But the wild type in my gardens gets a lot of pollinators, and they're fun because the nectar is at the very bottom of that bowl that is formed by the petals. And so the bees have to do a headstand to get the nectar. And that means their bodies get coated with pollen because they rub against the anthers. The one, the flower on the right, lower right, is golden alexanders. There's a couple of species in Minnesota. They are fairly short-lived perennials, but they, they keep reseeding themselves very well. Um, and I love to have them in the garden. I love that bright yellow color early on. And also, um, if you've had black swallowtail caterpillars eating your parsley, I could make a joke and tell you that it's because you don't have enough golden alexanders in your yard. Before European people brought parsley to this continent, there were black swallowtail caterpillars eating plants here. And the plants they were eating were um, the native members of the carrot and dill and parsley family. And golden alexanders is one of those. And it really does get quite a lot of black swallowtail caterpillars on it. So maybe you can distract them from your parsley. Spiderwort is unusual in that it does not produce any nectar. It produces only pollen. But based on what this green sweat bee is doing, uh, that pollen is quite attractive because this bee is doing a lot of work to collect that pollen. And a plant that I think is essential. I would say no garden is complete without this plant if you have the conditions to grow it. This is New Jersey tea. It is a shrub that looks like it dies back to the ground 
every winter and then it re-sprouts from the base of the stems and comes back bigger every year. It has a fairly long bloom period and it brings in a huge variety of pollinators. I don't think I've seen any single plant that brings in as many different species as this does. One of them, that butterfly, um, that is a summer azure butterfly and it's attracted in part because it wants to drink the nectar, but the flowers and leaves of New Jersey tea are the caterpillar food for these summer azure butterflies. And if you want to see the caterpillars, look for ants on the flowers. Because if you look very closely when you have ants on the flowers of New Jersey tea, this is what you'll see. The ants are tending these white and green caterpillars that blend very well into the flowers so well that I actually went back to photographs that I had taken of ants on New Jersey tea and discovered that, oh, there is a caterpillar in that photo. Um, for years, I've been photographing these caterpillars and I never saw one until one year. Uh, I think maybe I better look at all my photos. Uh, they're, they're everywhere. They're really, really cool. The caterpillars exude a little bit of a sugary liquid and that's what the ants will come to harvest. And in the process, they'll chase away anything that hassles the caterpillar. Then, of course, milkweed is essential, not just as food for monarch caterpillars. This little one has just hatched out and is eating its own eggshell before it goes on to eat the milkweed leaf. But all of the species of milkweed, daytime and nighttime, these are wonderful to have. So common milkweed, showy milkweed, world milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, you name it, um, they like it. Don't plant tropical milkweed, although in this climate, it's not a big deal because it dies off over the winter. But it's, um, it's a practice that um, has the potential to increase the infestation of parasites on monarchs. And so since it's not indigenous to our range, we should not be planting that species. We should be planting species that the monarchs expect to find here. Uh, I would also say Joe, not Joe Pieweed, Culver's root is really, really a great bee plant. It gets fairly tall. It gets these tall, narrow, white spikes of flowers, brings in a lot of bumblebees, brings in a lot of sweat bees, brings in beetles, brings in all kinds of things. Um, just a wonderful plant to have. Another one that I never did put in my yard in White Bear Lake, but I've added some here in St. Paul, and I want to see how it does. Um, mountain mint. Um, it is um, a particular favorite of wasps, and there's that Darth Vader wasp on the right again, the great black wasp. Then it, you got to have wild bergamot. You just absolutely have to have it. There are many varieties of Monarda. All of them attract pollinators, but the wild type, wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, will bring in more pollinators than anything else you could plant in that group. And one of the um, factors that makes it valuable, and here again, why are native plants important? Well, there are substances that are in the nectar of some native plants, and wild bergamot is one of them, which are immune system boosters for bees. Um, it helps them get rid of some of their parasite load if they nectar on wild bergamot. Turtlehead is another one, cranberry is another one. Um, I'm sure that others will be documented as time goes on. Joe pieweed, very nice to have if you can stand to have a plant that's taller than you are in your yard and that tends to fall over whenever it gets soaked with rain. Um, it's worth it because those flower clusters bring in not only butterflies and bumblebees, but also the little sweat bees and, and other insects. And in fact, in my own yard, my second Rusty Patch Bumblebee observation was on Joe Pieweed, so I'm sold on it. If it can bring endangered species to my yard, I'm going to have it. Blazing Star, you got to have Blazing Star, and very specifically, if you can grow Meadow Blazing Star, Liatris Ligulus Stylus, that's the one that attracts monarchs the best. If you have other Blazing Stars in bloom at the same time, the monarchs are still going to flock to the meadow blazing star. And it's, um, it's also really a gorgeous plant and it attracts a lot of other pollinators besides. Goldenrods, um, there are goldenrods that are very aggressive spreaders like Canada and Missouri goldenrod with their underground rhizomes. Showy goldenrod doesn't do that. 
it spreads by seed really well, as do um, asters and quite a few other species. But I think it's worth it because the number of bees on one flower can be beyond counting. I've, I've seen upwards of a dozen easily on each flower head. And all the other goldenrod species in the yard are just kind of looking on in envy, saying, why can't I attract bees like that? And then finally, towards the end of the season, you get into the time of year when you have asters in bloom. I love New England aster for the way that it looks, and it brings in a lot of pollinators, especially those flower flies. And panicled aster is kind of a fast spreading one. It's a rhizomatous species again, so it can form clumps. You can keep it under control if you plant it with other very competitive plant species, and then they kind of rein each other in. Um, and that one for me blooms later in the year than any other. I have had people suggest aromatic aster in that role, and I have planted aromatic aster now in my new yard, and I'm anxious to see how it does once it gets big enough. Then finally, I mentioned at the beginning beauty and detail. It really took this kind of macro photography for me to be able to see some of this detail that is evident in these photos. So this tiny little fly, this is a, a species of tachinid fly, um, look at the color on those wings. That is something I would never have seen with the naked eye, and it's gorgeous. All right, I will turn it over to questions. I know we're pressing 8 o'clock, and so um, let's see what we can do for me to answer some questions for you so you can go on to the next part of your meeting. All right. Thank you much, Dave. I think everyone really appreciated, especially the photography, the detail that you went into. And I, I know we do have a lot of questions here, so I will invite Lisa to share the ones that have been collected through the conversation. Yes, so the first question, hi Dave, thank you, um, was more of a statement. I know at the very, very beginning of your talk, you had said that honeybees are not native to North America. Right. Um, and then somebody said that honeybees were actually reintroduced to North America because there is fossil evidence of honeybees in Nevada from some time, time ago. Yeah. Okay. That's something I will look into because that's fascinating. Okay. Um, there is also a question about how close is too close for social wasps? Right. And that, not to get stung. Yeah, not to get stung. That really seems to depend on the, the time of year to some degree. Um, yellow jackets seem to get a lot more sensitive to people being near their nest towards the end of summer, around August. And prior to that, sometimes you won't even know they are there. But suddenly in August, they're popping out of the shrubs from underneath and saying, go away. Um, I, I won't prescribe what I think of as a safe distance. I will say that anytime you're dealing with an insect that can sting you, you need to use your best judgment to protect yourself. And so what works for you is the right thing. Um, I have eliminated social wasp nests on my property, even though I know they're beneficial, um, because I don't want to get stung. And so if they're in a location where I might come in contact with them, I eliminate them before that happens. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you have any advice on how to navigate the weedy plant laws of um, sort of the Twin Cities and surrounding area, given that many native plants are considered weedy? That's um, probably a topic for a, an entire presentation in itself. Every municipality seems to have a different definition and to have very uneven um, enforcement of their definitions. White Bear Lake, I was very fortunate that the weed ordinance, the lawn care ordinance for White Bear Lake was written by two members of the Minnesota Native Plant Society. So I was able to plant just about anything I wanted. And yes, we did get a warning ticket once from an inspector who said, your, your grass is too long. Um, but it wasn't actually grass and it wasn't actually too long. It just was a yard that didn't look like the other yards. And there was no basis on which that warning could ever have been enforced um, if you actually read the plant code for White Bear Lake. 
Uh, other places, Falcon Heights, I've heard, is very difficult. Um, I know there are other places that can be very difficult. And my best advice to folks is make the garden look formal. If it has a border around it, it's less likely to get ticketed. If it has plants growing together in clumps or in rows instead of helter-skelter, it's less likely to draw the attention of uh, somebody who thinks it's unsightly. And be sure to keep down the obvious weeds. If you've got curly dock and burr dock and, oh, like, um, lamb's quarters and some of the other annual weeds that are problematic, um, they are going to give an impression of an unkempt garden. And you want to make sure that your garden looks intentional, not unkempt. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do honeybees compete for food with native bees? There are more and more studies coming out that indicate that the answer is yes. Um, even though honeybees are generalists and can do just fine on non-native plants, they do also use native plants. And um, some of the studies coming out of, I think it's Sweden um, and other places in Europe have shown that there's a direct linkage between the increase in honeybee colonies that are being tended in any given area and the decline in bumblebees in those same areas. So it is a risk. Um, I wouldn't say never ever keep honeybees, but I would say think about what the pluses and minuses are if you're going to consider keeping honeybees. Okay, I've got two other questions. Um, there was a question about native nativars, so little joe pie versus the actual native plant. Do you have yeah. opinions on those? I don't know that particular cultivar. Uh, what I would say is that some research online to see if, uh, well, the Xerces Society, X-E-R-C-E-S is the spelling of Xerces. Um, and there is a link to that in the handout that I gave to Brianna. Um, they publish a lot of the science on native ours and cultivars and their impacts on pollinators. Um, what I would say is that a dwarf version that still blooms at the same time and has the same color flowers and blooms for the same amount of time probably is going to be just as much favored by pollinators as the wild type. And for some landscapes, obviously, you know, an eight foot tall um, sweet joe pie weed is just not a plant that belongs on a, a garden right next to a city street or a sidewalk. So there is a good place for those native ours, um, as long as they haven't been bred to the point that the pollinators can't use them. Okay, and then what was the competitive clumping aster that you mentioned? Oh, panicled aster. Panicled aster. Yeah. Um, and I think, scrolling through the rest of the questions, um, what are the purple candle flowers that are behind you? Oh, yes. In this photograph yes. um, that I'm using, my virtual background, that is lead plant. That's a member of the pea family. It's um, a shrub that is typically a prairie shrub. Um, it probably is going to do best in well-drained soil. Um, that front yard in the photo behind me is a part of what used to be White Bear Lake when White Bear Lake was a bigger lake than it is now. Um, and so it's basically a sandy bottom of a shallow bay of the old White Bear Lake uh, and grows lead plant absolutely fabulously. And it reproduces quite well on that soil, which is a little unusual. Great, and I think that was the last question that I can see. Yep. We had lots of comments about amazing pictures, videos, um, and the descriptions that you used were amazing and very relevant and understandable. Thank you. And it looks like somebody added a link to the, uh, the honeybee Fossil, if you want to scroll back up the chat. Yeah. Okay. 
article. Yeah, so that was really interesting. Uh, it's a scientific article, Brianna. Okay. So that would be an, I mean, if you're just looking to read up and see what's there. Yes, I'm scrolling up right now. I'm, I'll, I'll <laughs> no, find I, it. This was fantastic. And thank you so much for bringing all the information and the pictures. Oh my gosh. You're welcome. I, um, I have tried taking pictures of insects. I, mm, hats off. That is really hard to do. They move quite quickly. They do. Uh, it takes some time to develop techniques that will work. And, and part of it, people have been calling me the, the pollinator whisperer. Um, I think part of it is simply going in with an attitude that I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just here to document what you do. Um, I don't know how that works out. I think probably most of it is that I'm a sort of reserved person, except when I'm talking to a group, I get very um, motivated to do a lot of body language. But when I'm photographing, I'm more like a tree trunk. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, I did add for everyone here, uh, if you go to the chat channel, there is a link to the PDF. Uh, it might be clickable or you might need to copy and paste it. I'm hosting that off of our own website, so you can download that 